Hi there, we continue um, to look at Acts, um, through the book of Acts as we go through Lent. And we're now on Ch Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter eight, I think is quite an exciting um, passage. And maybe if you want to have a, open your Bible at the passage, maybe put your finger in the Bible to uh, Acts chapter eight, just so that we can, you can keep on referring to it. Maybe if you've not read it, have a read, pause, put, pause the video, have a read, and then we, we play it. It starts off, as we said, with, um, with um, Saul approving of what has happened, approving of the murder of Stephen for, um, for following and loving and obeying Jesus um, after Stephen has made a powerful and um, vehement defense of his faith, and not just a defense of his faith, but explaining to the people there that Jesus really was the Messiah. Jesus is God's fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus is God's fulfillment of the plan of God for salvation. And so, um, and then we see um, some interesting things happen. We see that, um, that Saul begins to, um, well, first of all, we see Stephen getting buried in um, verse two. And then we see um, Saul wanting to destroy the church, going from house to house, putting people in prison. There's the, you know, the persecution is starting to really crank up a new level. It, you know, you've seen from a little bit of, a little bit of the key leaders getting into some trouble to deliberately targeting people to, to murder and now people are being put in prison. And the idea is that actually as the um, people started to persecute um, the church, actually what happened was they caused the church to disperse and grow and new places began to um, hear the good news of Jesus and the gospel took root. Philip, one who's probably not Philip the, Philip the Apostle, but probably more likely Philip the other deacon, who was, um, you know, we had the story of Stephen the deacon, and now we have the story of Philip the deacon. Again, I believe this is um, Luke making the point that this is from, from Jesus to the disciple, to the initial disciples, to the next generation and the next generation. Luke, I think, is trying to make a point of the ripple effect that the gospel is the central character of the book of Acts, the prophecy of Jesus that um, God is going to, um, the kingdom is gonna grow from Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and then the ends of the earth. So then we see Samaria being, um, being impacted by the gospel through Philip, possibly a second generation disciple. Samaria, as you remember from the story, the Good Samaritan was an area that people didn't think much of. They weren't proper Jews. They weren't Jews like us. They were people on the edge. They're people who weren't considered to be quite right. Philip went down to Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah there. And people came and they listened. There were miraculous signs. People were, had demons delivered and there were many paralyzed and lame and healings. It was an amazing time of just fruitfulness and God doing amazing things. And then we have a little story which is often skipped over when we talk about um, Acts chapter eight. And that's Simon the sorcerer, a guy who's so excited by what he sees that he wants to follow, he wants to follow Simon, he wants to follow um, Philip but he doesn't quite get it. He still doesn't quite understand. I mean, people are being baptized in the name of Jesus. You know, that idea about dying to old life, dying to their past and rising to new life in Jesus. But then the, um, Peter and John arrive and they realize it's not just, the gospel is not just freedom from the past. The Holy Spirit comes and gives life to enable us to live for the future. But the important thing here is it's not just a theological idea that changes people. God's Holy Spirit's power is changing them. God is saying, I'm seeing no difference between the power of the Holy Spirit that's, that's touching the lives of Jews as touching the lives of Samaritans, not proper Jews. There is no distinction between the Holy Spirit that God generously gives to the Jew and the Samaritan. And Simon is so excited by what he sees the Holy Spirit do that he's, he's suddenly going, here, here, this is, this is, my, this is my ticket to, 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 to um, wealth and prosperity. Give me the Holy Spirit. I want to be able to do this sort of stuff. I want to be on stage. I want to be, I want to be the one waving a microphone about. I want to be the one in a flashy suit with people falling around all over us and people getting out of wheelchairs and um, all that sort of stuff. That's the sort of stuff I want to be doing. Um, I'll, I'll pay for it. And Peter was like, no, your money can, yeah, there's no use here. You've no share in this ministry. Your heart's not right. 
repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord and hope that he will forgive you for even having such a thought in your heart. You are full of bitterness and a captive to sin. Peter being um, Peter doesn't mince his words. <laughs> um, and suddenly Simon is convicted and he says, no, but I don't want that. No, no, pray to the Lord. So nothing you've said, nothing like that will, will happen to me. And then the, word, then the gospel continues to grow. But I think there's an interesting, an interesting um, thing with Simon. It's saying, who is in charge here? Who's the boss, if you like? Are we as Christians following and obedient to and in harmony and in step with the Holy Spirit? Or are we trying to use the Holy Spirit to prop up ourselves, our ideas, our ministry, our things? I think there's a, I mean, it's very easy to point at some of the um, excesses of some of the kind of more crazy American churches and some of the slightly dodgy ministries um, which seem to use the Holy Spirit in a very inappropriate, or what looks from our outside of you as a very inappropriate way. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing something here where God is saying, my Holy Spirit is mighty. My Holy Spirit is powerful. My Holy Spirit does amazing stuff. But actually, this is a privilege and a precious gift. Treat my Holy Spirit with respect. Treat my Holy Spirit as though the Holy Spirit is holy because he is. You know, actually, this is not your ticket to wealth and freedom. This is not your ticket to, to, to popularity and fame. You know, actually, to work in harmony with the Spirit of God means that we need to have our hearts right before him. To work in harmony with God means walking in obedience. To have our heart right with God means to be doing the things of God for the reasons of God. Not about, you know, mis misusing God for our own ends, misusing God for our own motives, to, to make money, to, to, for status, whatever, whatever, whatever. Interestingly, um, I've been talking to some other vicars of late with my um, School of Mission um, channel, my YouTube channel, and um, one of the things that's come across again and again and again is the danger of keeping your heart right. It's so easy to be busy in the ministry of God that our relationship with God just dries up, withers and dies. Actually, we need the sustaining life of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to speak to us, to whisper to us, to keep us right and in step with him. It's all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about God. And now we see that idea that it's all about Jesus and obedience. We almost have a massive contrast between Simon the sorcerer and Philip. Philip is there at the heart of it all going off. Philip is the key leader in, in Samaria and Samaria is, is like a revival town. It is, it, is, it is absolutely buzzing with the kingdom of God. And so what does the spirit, what the angel of the Lord say to Philip? He says, go to the desert road. That the, that from Jerusalem to Gaza. Go from this place of, of fruitfulness to go into the wilderness, to, go, to leave the people, the projects, the fame, the, 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 the buzz, the, the everything, to go where there appears to be nobody and nothing. And that must have been a hard call. He must be like, I don't want to leave here. I've got my friends here. I'm seeing stuff happen. Surely you want me here, God, because I'm I'm the key person. I'm the main leader. I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the, the one in charge. This is all my ministry. But yet he's obedient and he goes to the desert. He also goes at the hottest time of the day. He also doesn't seem to do as I would possibly do, a procrastinate and faff and time kill and take a long time to get from Jerusalem to, from, from sorry, to um, Samaria to, to the desert. He seems to hear the word of the angel of the Lord and go straight away. Angel also can be translated messenger, either way. And he starts out and he meets an Ethiopian eunuch who's evidently a kind of key um, official for, can, for, for it says Candice is some translation or, or Kandake in the, in the NIV, who's the queen of the Ethiopians. And he's, and he's, and the spirit tells Philip to go and run by the chariot. And as he's, as he's running by the chariot, he asks 
what are you reading? The guy's reading Isaiah the prophet says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. And here um, he has this amazing passage from Isaiah that's talking about Jesus saying, he was like a lamb, sorry, like a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, whom is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? So Philip began with this very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I heard someone say that um, there's something amazing about Philip's obedience and God's timing. Because Isaiah 53, if you're talking about Jesus, is not a bad place to start. Isaiah 52, or Isaiah 54, <laughs> is a little bit harder work. I probably, Philip could have still done it and God would have still opened the door. I'm not saying that. But actually, Philip arrived at the moment the guy was asking the question. He was in step with the Spirit. He was obedient, not only to the Spirit's place, but also the Spirit's timing. He was prepared to go and run at the hottest part of the day alongside a chariot, which was going probably a lot faster than walking pace, and ask a guy, a stranger, did he know what he was doing? It was a simple question, a question we could probably all ask, but yet he was prepared to, to, to be in the right place, to do the right thing, and to ask a simple question. And that caused the guy to come and explore the claims of Jesus. And interestingly, something very radical happened there as well. The, um, the gospel appearing to Gentiles. This is the first je clear Gentile who is baptized. As, as, as the Gentile hears the good news of Jesus, he says, what can stop me being baptized? Well, actually, if you read the Old Testament quite a lot, he's not Jewish. He's, he's, um, he's, he's defiled because he's been castrated. And yet, so clearly God is at work through Philip and working in the eunuch's life. As they came out of the water, Philip went and the eunuch returned to, um, back to Ethiopia. But it is believed that this eunuch took the gospel message of Jesus right to another, another continent. Philip's obedience with the one person we believed changed Africa, changed many people's lives. That one person can change the lives of many. I just want to end with a little story. It's a, probably a story you've, you may have heard before. I don't know if anyone has heard of the name of a guy called Mordecai, Mordecai Ham. Um, interesting guy, a fiery preacher. Actually had some, he, like a lot of these guys, he said some amazing things and he said some truly horrific things. Um, but there were some girls who wanted to hear this fiery preacher and they wanted to get a little group together and they had a little group and they thought, well, how are we going to get there? And so they asked this guy, Billy, if he would help them by driving, driving the van. And so this guy, Bill, drove a van to hear this fiery preacher, Mordecai Ham, um, preach with a, with a few girls and a few friends um, along the way. Um, and that evening, Billy Graham was converted. And Billy Graham has spoken to um, arguably more people on earth about Jesus than anyone since the New Testament times, packing stadiums like Wembley, stadium and others full of people hearing a clear presentation of the gospel that one person changed many people's lives that one conversation that philip had with the ethiopian was significant so often we think oh well i've just had a little chat with somebody about this or a little chat there we often don't realize the significance of the things we've said or things we've done but the bible says do not despise the day of small things one conversation we may have completely forgotten about may have been life-changing for somebody and may have had ripples that have gone for miles in eternity. We don't know. The only thing God calls us to be is not successful, is not to be fruitful. It is to be, well, it is to be fruitful, but most of all, it is to be obedient, to do what Jesus tells us, to be where Jesus tells us, to do the things he tells us and to talk to the people he gives us. So let's be like Philip obedient and in tune and in harmony with the Holy Spirit, rather than like Simon, seeing what the Holy Spirit does and but wanting to do it our way, not God's way. 
a very simple choice we used to do um, an assembly like this I don't know maybe it's a little bit over simplistic but we used to have a, um, a two branches of a signpost one way with an arrow saying God's way and one way with an arrow saying our way and asking which way do we want to go God's way or our own way because God's way even if we don't always understand it even if we don't always get it, even if it seems hard and difficult, and it often does, often feels like going into the wilderness at the hottest time of the day, is the way that is fruitful, is the way that brings life, is the right way, and is the future.